gosh, he's got you whipped, Clemmy. I know it. The Chartable Champion has done it again and given me quite a headache. Oh, my darling cat. Oh, it's nothing. Now, will you please change out of those unspeakable dungarees? Uh, Brendan and the prof will be here in a minute. We're going to the kinema. I don't want to change slides. Then please, please, my dear pig, will you speak to Randolph now? You know the Americans. And your own lecture tour was such a success. Yes. I lost every penny I made. Well, that's just it, Papa. Well, I, I could surely earn enough over there to save you my allowance. Oh. I know Brendan agrees with me. Well, I don't think Mr. Bracken need concern himself with any of this. Huck you, huck you. Wow. They're so keen to have him, Winston. And he'd do you proud. One of his Oxford friends says he's got a mind like a machine gun. Precious use that'll be if he's got no ammunition to put in it. I've got you now, my kitten. Ah, well, Oxford's the place where a young man may draw his ammunition and oil the bolts and battle of his mind for his country's service. Oh. You must consider what will happen to you if you leave without completing your course, without even taking a degree. I shall only be absent for one term, Papa. And the lectures will be most frightfully useful. For the money, I mean. The almighty American dollar. Yes, I dare say. How stand your debts now, Randolph? Five hundred, I'm afraid. A young man can live perfectly well on four. I know, Prof, but I have tried. Oh, don't be silly, Randolph. Many good people work a great deal harder for much less. Oh, Lord. What is this thick, creamy performance? Soup. Soup? You know it's soup. It can't be soup. Soup is always clear. Soup is limpid. Uh, Papa, and what, pray, would be the theme of these precocious and presumptuous lectures of yours? Well, why I'm not a socialist, for one, and perhaps the British Empire, world progress, the Americans are going to want value for their money, you know. What have you prepared, apart from the titles? Well, actually, I have been thinking about them last month in Germany. Without execution, thinking is mere idleness. He, uh, he can work aboard ship. Yes. Mm. On the first day afloat, he'd be unwell. On the second day, he'd feel better and decide to start work on the third day. On the third day, he'd run across a pretty girl and let her be there. I'm sorry, Papa. I really was hoping that you'd let me go. I haven't said you may go. You shall go. When you and I have prepared your lectures together. It's for you, sir. Mr. Baldwin. Stanley Baldwin. I wonder what he wants. No why, no wherefore. Just, um, come up. Just come up. Can it be that the ironmonger is becoming rattled in his old age? I would remind you, Brendan, that Mr. Stanley Baldwin is little older than myself. <laughs> rattled is not a word I would apply to Baldwin. He is far too cautious. Far too cunning. Oh, come now, Prof. The trouble he's in would rattle the Sphinx. Two years ago, you scarcely heard a word of criticism against him. Now you hear it from all wings of the party, his leadership, his lack of grip, and what's worse, Rothermere and Max Beaverbrook are both ganging up on him. Stanley never did learn to hide his contempt for the press. And so they want his scalp. Hang it all, isn't this our great opportunity? Here we are with the socialists making a hash of the government, a disaster of the economy, and what's our party doing? It's racked with discord. I can't believe that even the most fossilized members of the Shadow Cabinet haven't realized that Stanley Baldwin will be a liability in any general election. The Tory party ever did its leader before an election with victory in sight. But what if it's the leader that'll cost them that victory? What's needed now is energy and inspiration. And not the ironmonger's strong point. And you believe, my dear Brendan, Winston could provide both, don't you? And hence, the necessary leadership. Don't you? Don't forget. Many Tories still consider me a newcomer to their party. They see uh, Neville Chamberlain as the rightful heir. Neville? <laughs> My God. Mayor of Birmingham in a bad year. Who wants him? 
The support for you in the country is extraordinary. Your chances now are better than they have ever been. Stanley Baldwin is a little more than the genial pipe smoker of Brook Street you make him. He's a politician of the highest skill. Perhaps he thinks Winston will not be ready to pay the price of leadership. What price? India. He's right. And so am I. About India. You see, Brennan? Chamberlain, Hall, and the rest of them may want a change of leadership, but Winston will. Winston is something of a problem for them. Stanley Baldwin knows that. He is a very clever man. A stalemate can sometimes be a, a very satisfying situation. It's not too much to ask, is it, Winston, that you um, accept or at least acknowledge uh, the agreed policy of the Conservative Party? On the matter of India, it's a damned dishonorable policy. But furthermore, it is not agreed. The party has not yet openly debated the question of self-government for India. You are seeking to impose that policy no, no upon it. leader nowadays may command a blind loyalty, but uh, uh, we are all of us obliged, are we not, to work together for the common aim. The aim of a minority Labour government, are we? We have not yet accepted it in conference. I know my obligations to my party, and they do not include joining a rabid socialist government in its attempt to destroy the united fabric of India and all that we have achieved there. That is an absurd distortion, and typical of the things you've been writing. So you read my articles, Sam. Excellent. The idea that dominion status means war between Hindu and Muslim. Utter rot. India's already drenched with their blood. Any move towards full independence will make matters worse. Winston, that is imperialist nonsense. Anyway, who ever said anything about full independence? Nobody has yet. But his so-called dominion status is full independence by the back door. An agitator like Gandhi won't accept the half loaf you're offering. Uh, will you um, stay to lunch, Winston? Mrs. Baldwin will be delighted to see you. No, thank you, Stanley. Oh, that's a pity. Uh, but I do ask for your patience in this matter. If I may decide whether or no it serves the interests of my country. You see, Winston, you're stumping up and down the country in support of this Indian Empire Society of yours and on newspaper articles. You're open to criticism of our policies. Well, they all suggest to the public, at any rate, uh, that you may be attempting to divide the party. Seeking power for its own sake. As I heard someone describe it. The venom of a man's enemies is the measure of his own strength. Oh, I did hope you'd see it less subjectively. The trouble is, of course, that as a member of our shadow cabinet... Are you suggesting I should resign? Oh, we should all be most unhappy. No, 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 no. No, of course not. Uh, but, but we do think we have the right to know where you feel your loyalty lies. Upon my conscience, Sam, where do you place yours? Good morning. Albert! Well, damn it, are you there? Sir? Have you found my reading glasses? No, sir. Where did you leave them? Well, damn it, I haven't been out of this room for five days. Three, sir. And have you replaced those handkerchiefs you purloined? No doubt you mislaid them with your spectacles, sir. Was that all you wanted? Luncheon will be at 1.30. Or bring Mr. Churchill his usual drink. With your Vichy water, yes, sir. And one of your handkerchiefs, if you please. Very good, my lord. I got him. I always know I got him when he calls me my lord. He doesn't take your handkerchiefs. No, I know. But the virtuous enjoy the martyrdom of false witness. You let that fox Baldwin trick you. 
He made you take the first step out of the shattered cabinet. We well, must have your moment of spite, I suppose. I've been reading your speeches on India. Amongst other things, they lack the right note of sincerity. Thank you, Max. Candor, season, good friendship. Well, then be frank with me. You didn't come here for sympathy. What do you want? You said it yourself in the Express last week. My editor said it. Max, Lord Beaverbrook's editors do what they're told. And last week you said that the whole world must soon think us down and out. Well, so? Max, both of us now have the opportunity and the power to restore the country's faith in the Conservative Party. Albert! That was too damn quick. You were standing outside the door. I found it necessary, sir, in order to open it. So you want my newspapers to help you dethrone Baldwin? You know you distrust the man. Dethrone him and crown you. Good God, Max, is there anybody else you'd rather see in his place? Oh, perhaps not. But did it ever occur to you that I might not be Warwick the Kingmaker? I might turn out to be Oliver Cromwell. There you go! Oh, monstrous. A monstrous personal attack. But ineffective, wouldn't you say, Neville? Lovely! Winston put Max Beaverbrook up to it, of course. Oh, is that tea still hot, Sam? Only Nancy Astor would expect her guests to watch badminton in November. Get it! It's cold. I've tried it. If Winston won't... Could they bring us uh, some more, do you think? If Winston won't tell the lie, you must dismiss him from the shadow cabin. Uh, could we have uh, some more tea, please? Certainly, sir. These political extremists who now hold their cabinet meetings in a prison cell will come to this roundtable conference demanding total independence and secession from the Empire. Is the British Raj to be replaced by a Gandhi Raj? What? What, uh, Brenda? First rate. But uh, don't waste it on one article. Say it in public and you'll get coverage in every paper in the land. You have a constituency meeting on Thursday, the weekend at Sanish, and two more on Monday and Tuesday. Then it'll do. No. That way you only make the Sunday papers. Save it for the meeting of the Indian Empire Society. And bang the argument home when you're up in Manchester. There were a note from Manchester, the India bill, and uh, the coming collapse of the Labour government. <laughs> Yeah. If MacDonald does collapse, what will Baldwin do? Ah! Do? He'll form a government. And you? Oh. How could I join him? To save the party, I must stand aside from Baldwin and his Clibden cohort. Max Beaverbrook's on my side. And the Daily Mail may run a leader for me next week. I'm seeing Harold Rothermere on Tuesday. I'm glad you like the leading article. I think it sets out the issues quite clearly. Never better, thank you, Harold. I told them to stick to your own theme. The need to break the alliance on India between MacDonald and Baldwin. Oh, I'm so glad you found something real to get your teeth into. But I feel much stronger since this Indian business came up. I care about it. More than gaining office. Or even keeping my friends. No, the party must turn to you, Winston. Uh, one day, you must lead the whole nation. Now, we have what? A month before the Commons debate on the India question. You must scupper Baldwin before that. Well, no. The choice between us should be made on the floor of the House. Now, if I hammer this Labour government hard, then Baldwin will never dare support them over their betrayal of India. Uh, and thus you become the only true voice of the party. Uh, excellent. It's uh, very well. And your happy brood. Well? It's a very generous offer, Winston, and I'm grateful, but I do not need and I do not want a new motor car. 
is it that you're afraid to drive? It's nothing, nothing at all. I'd oh. rather have the money. But for the umpteenth time of asking, would you be good enough to tell me why? I thought I'd hop on a boat in January and go and see Randolph in New York. January? I believe I should be with him. We're not as close as we ought to be. And I can listen to all his lectures and write to you about Harry, him. Harry, Clemmy, don't chatter. In January, I must make the greatest speech of my life. I may unseat Baldwin. And you propose to be absent. Why? Why, Clemmy? Why do you want to leave me? Because... Because I can't... Oh, it's so impossible to explain. It sounds so ridiculous. You don't really need me. Do let me go, Winston. You're doing this, you're saying this, out of spite. That is nonsense. Just because I've asked Brendan to join us all for Christmas, you come up with this. Do you know, I think that I'm abandoning my vendetta against Mr. Bracken. Now, do you think I'm becoming broad-minded, or is it senility creeping in? Why must you always talk so shabbily when we speak of my closest friend? Mr. Bracken is not your friend. He's a charlatan, an upstart nobody, and a cad who encourages the rumors that he's your bastard son. I suppose they are untrue. Oh, well, well, I don't know. It's hard to disprove paternity, you know. Must you be so flippant? Well, perhaps they are true. You know they're not. Why must you bring up that malicious story again? It's cruel of you to use it so trivially in peak. We Very well, then. Go to New York. I don't give a damn. Go to the boy if you think he needs you more than I do. Hang in, Winston. Don't weaken. The pub thinks it's bad tactics, Dad. Lindemann's not a parliamentarian. Go hard at the government and harder still at Ramsay MacDonald. If you make a fool of the man, you'll carry the party with you. Baldwin won't dare say a word in defense of the government. Brendan, did you ever see Barnum's Circus? We must not be foolish enough to speak in defense of weakness, surrender, or betrayal. Yeah. We shall not, I dare hope, forget that our great nation has no wish to be pushed, edged, talked, and cut in out of India. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Two centuries of achievement, many brave lives expended upon valiant fields, many more spent in devoted service to the peoples of India, have earned us the right, the obligation of government no, no, no. in India. I, uh, I do not expect to hear words of surrender from the leader of my own great party, the leader of His Majesty's opposition. But I wait, as all of us in this house must wait, to hear words of some kind from the right honorable gentleman who leads this irresponsible government. Then sit down and listen, you silly man. Uh, I warn this house, do not expect cogent defense of abysmal surrender. Do not expect strength where there is only ignoble weakness. When uh, I was a child. I was taken to the uh, celebrated Barnum's uh, Circus. Of its many uh, advertised attractions, there was one that I most earnestly desired to see. It was that one, described as the boneless wonder. <laughs> uh, my parents, however, judged it too revolting, too uh, demoralizing for my tender eyes. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I have waited 50 years to see the boneless wonder, and now I see him there on the chicken bench. May God help us all. Mr. Baldwin? 
Mr. Speaker, no one in this house uh, can have more respect than I uh, for the sincerity of the right honourable member for Epping. I shall come shortly to the uh, points of his argument. But in disassociating myself now from the tone of his address, I'm obliged to say that um, intemperate emotion, however deeply felt, uh, that uh, personal animosity, however wittily expressed, uh, can only exacerbate our difficulties and um, muddy the clear waters of responsible debate. <laughs> In uh, pledging myself and my great party to a just solution of our country's affairs in India, I solemnly assure the House that uh, when the Conservative Party is returned to power, <laughs> proper implementation of an Indian constitution will be among the first of our actions. <laughs> no one would actually have believed it possible. He supported the government. When the party supported him, you know what he thinks he'll do now, don't you? At least don't give him that satisfaction. I have no choice. No choice at all. Politics are foul. Too foul for words. May you, you don't mind uh, Sam being present to you? And I've written to you, Sam. Really? What about? My deepest sympathy for you on the loss of your mother. Thank you. Uh, you won't uh, change your mind about this business. Well, I stand there. The divergence of our opinions is now public. In conscience, I can no longer attend meetings of your shadow cabinet. Well, you'll be greatly missed. But uh, you're doing as you think best, I know. My letter of resignation will come to you this evening by express messenger. It will, of course, uh, be called you. Oh, of course, of course. We've always been friends. But moreover, your allegiance to the party is beyond that. If the socialists go to the country this year, I shall do my damnedest to secure their defeat. Oh, that's handsome of you, isn't it, Sam? Until when, my dear Stanley, I shall feel free to speak when, where, and how I wish. Your resignation has proved the wisest step you could have taken. The alternative was to knuckle under. Uh, Professor Lindemann says I've moved further into the political wilderness. It's not what we've said there, is it? You approve, I hope? I don't approve of the mixed metaphor in the second paragraph, but otherwise, yes. Thank you. Oh. The country is responding to you with the most remarkable enthusiasm. You can now go forward, Winston. Unswervingly forward. Nothing can stand in the way. The editor, I don't need to advise you politically. But you can always rely on... Oh, I noticed a mixed metaphor in your leader on Mr. Churchill. Otherwise, it's perfect. Please print it. Yes, I shall be at the office. The dispirited nation needs a resolute leader with a courage to cut through. I am most impressed by that German fellow. I am a Democrat, Harold. Come hell or high water. You do realize, of course, you are well on the way to be Prime Minister. No. I can't speak publicly against Baldwin, you know that. Mm. You don't have to. We will. My separation from the Shadow Cabinet has not proved a setback you feared. Baldwin may have forced me out, but his action has rebounded against him. Now the whole party is turning towards me, whilst my support grows daily in the country. I think Baldwin may soon be driven from office himself. Then anything may happen. I love you very much. Although you are far away, we are really very close. Tender love and a thousand kisses from your devoted and loving husband. Lonely, 
talking about fat. My editors tell me you have become the man of the hour. So, David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And the men of Israel and Judah arose. Yes, I saw the tailpiece of the express leader column. Oblique, but prophetic, I hope. A little too early to think you got Baldwin on the run. He'd break into a gallop if only you'd give me more positive support. I, I intend to use the wireless as soon as possible to see if I can't quicken his step even more. BBC will turn you down, you know. John Reith has no time for political mavericks. Uh, I quoted your broadcast as a president. <laughs> I'm no politician. Humbug, Max, you rode your own hobby horse, Empire Free Trade. Yes, and it's the only answer. And another area where your judgment is unsound. India is the grand issue. It's the only damn platform you're taking against Baldwin. Fall off that just once and you're finished. Not with the support I'm getting. You've got next to none in the commons. Oh, outside the diehards may agree with you in your Victorian attitude towards India. But who else gives a damn? The war put the finish to that nonsense about the white man's burden. The public wants to get off their shoulders and the quicker the better. Say the past is past and let it go. No, Max. Say that and we surrender the future. Well, you know, a lot of uh, Baldwin's men uh, Hold with me on empire free trade. Throw them a bone and I could put them in your pocket overnight. No, Max. Well, all right then. How about writing an article for me in the Express about uh, food taxes? That's an area where we share the same general opinions, don't we? All right, your piece. On India. God damn it, Winston. I'll not bargain for your health, Max. What's wrong with a little honest horse trading? You used to be sound on India. Now you're holding back. Why? Okay. Why can't you be honest? Okay. If public opinion seems to be going along with you now, it's because India is in such a bloody mess. And the government must be responsible. But remember this. Gandhi's out of jail out there and having tea with the Viceroy. What happens to you and people who support you if he suddenly decides to call off civil disobedience and do a deal across the table? All right, old friend. I'll chip away at the ironmonger in my own fashion. And you hammer away on India, if you must. I don't think Stanley is going to resign just because a press lord suggested. But it is a possibility, isn't it? Not if it means Winston. What if it means you? I'm the one person, I think, who could persuade Stanley to resign. But not if I'm to replace him. Yeah. What did you um, talk about at uh, luncheon? Hmm? Well, I mean, you, uh, you must have touched on the subject, surely. Well, he did ask the political situation being so rocky, the party divided, he did ask whether he should go. Well, what, what did you say? But I couldn't say anything, could I? Well, what did he say? Well, nothing. He just winked. He has made up his mind to resign. Well, why would he wink? We must dissuade him as soon as possible. Can't have Winston leaping into the gap. Heaven forbid. But Stanley's policy on India is becoming increasingly unpopular with the party rank and file, whereas Winston could still rally them. Forgive me, S.B., but uh, the feeling in the party is now so unhappy that... Uh, Bracken is already boasting that Winston's got you on the run. You did say you'd talk it over with Mrs. Baldwin. Are you anxious to be rid of me, Neville? No. No, of course not. But uh, in view of the uncertainty in the country... Well, Mrs. Baldwin did say that um, if I went, we'd at least have a little more time with our family. And if you believe, if you think uh, the party really wants me to go. No, no, Neville didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. I mean, there is your alternative suggestion, but I can't imagine that you mean it. 
what alternative? That I should uh, resign my seat, Noel, and uh, stand again in some uh, neutral constituency. On a vote of uh, confidence, you might say. But you can't do that. What if it should fail, with the party being divided? Think of your successor. Winston, you mean? No, of course not. Well, I don't give a damn about uh, my successor, whoever you think he might be. But I'm not resigning. I've decided to go down fighting. Does that alarm you? Well, then take heart. And pray for a stroke of good luck. An agreement? With that half-naked, table-hopping, babu troublemaker? Winston. All right with Mr. Gandhi, barrister at law. He never call off civil disobedience after nothing. No. He has the Viceroy's assurance that he can attend a new conference as an equal negotiator. If Baldwin's fool enough to approve, then hallelujah, I've got him! Dominion status. We lose control. Army, law, financial institutions. Gandhi gets right to secede from British Empire. Is that what we want? I put that in capitals. Good. Then, woolly legislation. No safeguards. Bloodshed. Then finally, but put this in caps, Mrs. B. India for the agitators. Never. Never. That too strong for central office. I think not. What's next? Ah. Uh, well, I've told the farm manager you can see him in the morning. Something to do with the Edenbridge show, I think. Why, yes, the pigs. That's next soon. We shall win again, you know. Yes, of course. <laughs> Baldwin. Good morning, Prime Minister. I imagine it must be a very important matter that's brought you here. It is. Winston intends speaking at the Albert Hall on the 18th. Does he indeed? And will he attack the agreement with Mr. Gandhi? Not a doubt of it. Mr. Churchill is a sair thorn in your flesh. And in the governments, as uh, you'll discover. How so? You're hoping for my party's support. Uh, when uh, the House uh, debates India on the 24th. I've had your assurance of it. Are you proposing to withdraw? I'll be frank with you, uh, Ramsey. No party has been so divided as mine is now. Mm -hmm. I've read of your difficulties. Mm, with a rank and file, for the most part. For the time being, I have the loyalty of most of my parliamentary members. For the time being? Well, however he words it, Winston's speech will be taken as an attack on my leadership and will divide the party yet further. My backbench members may respond to his words. I see, I see. And uh, vote against the government on the 24th. That would be a pity, my dear Baldwin. But if you had the opportunity to make your own views on India public... Uh, in the House? Before the 18th. Oh, then I'm confident I could rally my backbenchers behind me and away from Winston. Then we need a new date for the debate, don't we? Oh, it's not for me to uh, presume upon your calendar. Uh, the 12th, I think. Uh, my dear Baldwin, I do believe that I've stumbled on the solution. <laughs> a stroke of luck, Prime Minister. A right honourable member of this house whom I shall not name has consistently made such dangerous appeals in relentless opposition to all settlement in India. The twister. He's done a deal with a boneless wonder. Ah, oh, really? Is it necessary? He's got you now, Winston. You're done for. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Speaker, it is true that there are members of my party in this House who would still approach this great opportunity in a niggling, grudging spirit, determined to throw obstacles in the way of those who seek only the well-being, the prosperity and survival of the British Empire with justice and self-determination for all its peoples. 
Mr. Speaker, it is perhaps not the place to say this, but the great issues involved impel me. If such small-minded men represent a majority in my party, then I, then I say to them, and I would rather have said it in the privacy of our own considerations, be rid of me in God's name. Be rid of me and find one of your own to lead you. Speaker, I warn this House that although civil disobedience in India has been set in temporary abeyance, it will return. It will return with concomitant bloodshed and horror. I am no advocate of brutal force in India, but there can be no guarantee of peace in that unhappy country until a sufficient military spent it all. Little more, as a matter of fact. Then what, pray, do you mean by a little more? Well, <clears throat> um, about $2,000, Papa. You earn $12,000 and you spend fourteen. Yes. At 20, you were already a wastrel and a spendthrift. You have gambling debt tradesmen's bills, and yet you feel yourself able to hire a magnificent automobile and a chauffeur at what? Seven or eight hundred a year? Papa, if you let me explain. Have you no honor? I shall do what is necessary for your welfare, but I grieve to see you, you with so many gifts, leading a life of such thoughtless and lavish folly and wanton extravagance. I, I had meant... Go away! Words are useless! Go away! Good morning, my dear. Will you take breakfast with us? Good morning, Clemmie. <clears throat> Good morning, Papa. Good morning, Randolph. A small token of my affection for you, my dear boy. For me? For why, Papa? And a little something for us to drink. <laughs> oh, Winston. Do you think you should? So extravagant. Have you read the papers? I know, I know. The economy grows bleaker, our investments dwindle. Winston, there are two million people out of work. Mr. MacDonald is begging the Americans to save us from financial ruin, and you, have you any idea how much champagne costs? You haven't been gambling, have you? Papa, it's marvelous. It was my father's gift to me. And now it is mine to you. 
What will happen, Papa? Ramsey Mack heads a bankrupt government and an all but bankrupt nation. Well, I suppose he'll uh, try and barter his way through to autumn on American dollars. Well, he can never agree to their terms, surely. A 10% cut in the unemployment pay? Bang goes one of the cornerstones of the socialist policy. Well, well, he's already betrayed us over India. His passion for disarmament blinds him to the new German militarism. He'll betray us there, too. But sooner or later, he'll betray his own people. And you, Papa, what will you do? I... I shall be ready. You shall be back in office before winter, I feel sure. It's possible. But the first time is right. By then, we must all take a holiday. Hmm? We're in the south of France. Winston? Winston, is that you? Brendan? My dear boy, what's up? Winston, you must come home at once. Well, come, come home. I've only just got here. Winston, there's going to be a general election in a few weeks' time. Good Lord alive, why, why? Because the crisis is here. The Labour Party has collapsed. It's splitting up before our eyes. MacDonald has been deserted by the trade unions and half his cabinet. He wanted to resign. But the king has asked him to stay on and form an all-party or a national government, if he can. A national government? Why, my dear boy, we don't want any part of that. Ah. Don't be so sure, Winston. They'll fight the election under that banner. The Conservatives and what's left of MacDonald's socialists are in it together. Baldwin and the rest of them have all agreed to serve. They're trying to present a united front. Well, don't you see? They have to offer you a job. They can't risk you being on the outside. And Winston, you must come home at once and talk to Baldwin. He'll have to get you a ministry. I spoke to the king yesterday. Were it within his constitutional powers, I do believe that he'd insist on a continuation of this national government. He fears that party dispute may tear the country to pieces. Well, we, we need to know what the country, what the people think of this hermaphrodite government. Oh, well, yes, of course, I too believe in the democratic process. But do you realize, Winston, that the appeal could split our party as well as Labour? And that will be chaos, utter chaos. Uh, whatever our differences, yours and mine, do we want that? I want honorable government, naturally. But I hope that no one in our party, mindful of His Majesty's concern, forgive me, Winston, if I express this lamely, but may we not expect your old indomitable loyalty? You know that I shall do everything in my power to halt the destructive advance of the Socialist Party. Yes. Yes, Stanley, you can count on my support. Oh, my dear Winston, that's splendid. At a time like this, a man of your ability and skill will be badly needed by the country. And by the new administration, too. I'm sure MacDonald can be convinced of that. <laughs> He'll be a strange bedfellow. But I'm ready, if called, to serve our national government. Thank you, Winston. You can rely on me to tell him that. The conservative, the national conservatives will thus hold ten, yes, ten cabinet posts. Is this not, I must say, I find it disproportionate. An equitable reflection the country may feel about our overwhelming return at the polls. Yes, there's one more, Prime Minister. The Treasury, I understood. No. Not him. As you wish. I felt obliged to uh, put his name before you. And if I had accepted it? Well, I do believe I'd have been further obliged. 
uh, to talk you out of it. It's monstrous. It's, it's shabby to promise you and then, then to cast you aside. Your Baldwin promised me nothing. I should have seen that. Oh, well, well, then he tricked you. I mean, that's, that's the thing that you'd expect from a cheating tradesman. I shall write to him. No, Clemmy. It hurts me more to see it upsets you so. He tricked me, yes, but uh, I was betrayed by my own vanity and ambition. I wish you'd never left the Liberal Party. Oh, my darling, I do love you. It's done, it's past, and I am poor. Come to America with me and I will make a fortune. <laughs> Fifty cents, sir. Thank you, Cabby. Good night. Hey! What's your name? Right Honourable Winston Spencer Churchill from England. The collision was was equivalent to falling 30 feet onto a pavement. That is to say, the uh, the shock was probably proportional to the rate of energy transferred, and uh, and that rate inversely proportional to the cushions of flesh about Mr. Churchill's skeleton. If one assumes, therefore, that Rough. Mr. Churchill's skeleton. Rough. These young gentlemen have not come here so far from their illustrious school to hear you lecture them upon the wondrous resilience of my body. <laughs> Pray proceed, Master Journalist. Sir, would you like to live your life again? I believe I would. Provided I could start at 20 and go no further than 25. Sir, what has been your most successful achievement? Survival, I think. To survive is to have the chance to begin again. Sir, what has made you a great speaker? I, I've never excelled as a speaker. I've often, often failed as a speaker. Sir, what, what advice would you give to young people now that your great career is over? You go up to the house now, boys. Cook will give you some tea. <laughs> 